1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual walk that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, also, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, as they are written for our admotion, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship of devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold to the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if any man shall say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not, for his sake that showed it, and for his conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of that which I, which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor the, to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they might be saved. That they may be saved. Amen. Thank you, brother. So 1 Corinthians 10 is a favorite passage of mine. I love that it takes these varying Old Testament events and accounts from Numbers 25 and Numbers 21 and Numbers 14 and brings them to relevance in the New Testament. Exodus 32 is also in there in these four different accounts or examples of things. 
And so this is just one of those verses that always just affirms to me that I need to study the Old Testament. I need to be in Numbers. I need to be in Exodus because these things are, are important. They're not archaic. They're not for the Jews and not for me. Every word is every mind, every chapter, every verse, every line that, that song goes. And I apply them. In the first portion of 1 Corinthians 10, we'll deal with that. The second portion begins to talk about the communion of the blood of Christ and, and different things about eating things sacrificed unto idols and so on. But we'll leave that alone for another time. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he begins to talk about how those that went and were baptized in the cloud and passed through the sea and ate that spiritual meat and partook of that spiritual drink, it was all them, as an example, partaking of Christ. That rock was Christ. And they, as a group, experienced Christ and walked with Christ. Those that passed over the sea are referred to as being baptized. It was a rite of passage for them. He says in verse 6, Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. He says, don't be idolaters as were those that sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. In Exodus 32. Don't commit fornication like those in Numbers 25 who, who did commit that sin and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither tempt Christ as some were tempted and were destroyed of serpents, Numbers 21. Neither murmur ye, and one example is Numbers 14, as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer, but that seemed to be the, the, general, <laughs> the general way of Israel in the wilderness was to murmur and to complain, to tempt Christ. He says again, iterating what he said in verse 6, Verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So Paul writes this down, gives it to the Corinthian church. And here I stand about 2,000 years later, taking those ex same examples as they are written down for admonishment to me. We have verse 11 as examples to them, things that happened that are admonitions to us in order that we could learn from them. Verse 12, it says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So if I'm thinking that I'm standing strong in my faith, if I think that I'm, I'm, I'm grown enough that... I won't be tempted with idolatry and fall. Take heed. If I think that I'm not going to get sucked into fornication because I'm standing so strong in my faith, well, take heed lest ye fall. Tempting Christ, murmuring against Christ, the temptation is there, and I ought to take heed lest I fall to it. Now, when temptation comes our way, the Bible says we are not unique in experiencing that. We're not alone. That's not some special thing that temptation should fall upon Christians. Temptation belongs to everybody. Verse 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So men also, everywhere and in all places, are tempted to lust after evil things. As the children of Israel, as God's people were, and they succumbed to it. They fell in the lust of those evil things. The whole world is tempted to idolatry. The whole world is tempted to fornication. Every man has the common temptation to tempt Christ and to murmur and many such things. These are obviously just a few examples of temptations that can come upon us. You remember when Satan went and tempted Jesus in the wilderness, it was with the lust of the flesh. It was with the lust of the eyes. It was with the pride of life. It was with, like verse 6 says, lust after evil things is what men lust after. And Jesus' 
recourse, response every time to these temptations was thus saith the scriptures, thus saith the word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. And so we have what is written here, and I believe it's written here to be our examples. And Jesus used those examples in order to arm himself against the temptations that came upon him. The word of God was what got Jesus out of temptation. And as we walk in his steps, we also, we also ought to use the word of God as our escape from temptation. He says there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And so every man experienced temptation at the same level. That common level is experienced. But, and here's the contrast to you, a common temptation to men. Here's the contrast to you, but God is faithful. And he's going to be faithful to those that are faithful to him. God is faithful who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted above that ye are able. Okay? But will with the temptation, that common temptation experienced by all men that you are going through that draws you into lusts after evil things, that same temptation will be accompanied for you with, the Bible says, will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Every man is tempted, but not every man has a faithful God who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will rather give you a way to escape to the end that you can bear it. Look what he says there in the second portion of that verse. It says, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Able what? Well, it says in the second portion, I've circled them and drew a line between it, that ye are able to bear it. God will not allow you to be tempted without giving you a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, bearing a temptation is the same as, as, as bearing a weight, bearing a load, going under it. In other words, God is giving you escape in order that you can come under temptation, have it weigh you down, have it affect you, even, even suffer it a little bit, even put up with a little bit. But ye are able, along with that way of escape provided to you, to bear the temptation so that, while you may be tempted to lust after the evil things, you won't be, verse 7, idolater. You won't be, verse 8, a fornicator. You won't be tempting Christ. You won't be murmuring against Him. Why? Because you've been admonished by all these examples. You've been given the way to escape. And you're able to bear the temptation as it comes upon you. He says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, in verse 14, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. And so God here is indicating that wise men are going to hear what the Apostle Paul is penning down here. They're going to flee from idolatry, and that is one of the ways of escape. Simply free, flee from the idolatry. Flee from the, the temptation to fornicate. Flee from the temptation to even tempt Christ and murmur against Him. That's our way of escape, and I believe our way of escape is the same as the Lord's would. It is the Word of God, and our Word of God is that Word made flesh, which dwelt among us, that we beheld as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That Word of God is Jesus. He is always our way to escape. So then I believe that those who fall, being Christians... Not just the common man, not just the one in temptations common to man. The one who has God faithful to them. The one who has been provided the way to escape. Those who fall, they didn't take heed. Because God says, look, if you think you're standing here, take heed lest you fall. And who fell? The fornicators that were God's people. Who fell? Those that tempted Christ that were God's people. Who fell? Those that became idolaters and fell to them temptation to lust after evil things, in that they committed those very evil things. Those who fell were given more than they could handle, is what I'm saying here. I believe this is the case verse that people use to say, look, God will never give you more than you can handle. I believe, actually, though, that God will give you perhaps more than you can handle at this particular time as far as temptation goes, but he will also, with that temptation, give you a way to escape so that you are able to bear it. And I believe the whole of Scriptures testifies to God putting men to 
trial and temptation, which is beyond what they are able to overcome. But there is that way to escape given to every one of them. And so we have a record in our scriptures of men who were tempted and yet overcame because God helped them to bear it as they walked with him. So they were given more than they could handle, but what men that fall do is they don't use that way to escape. They use their own wisdom. They follow their own understanding. I think they could have bore with the temptation when they became idolaters, sat down, ate, and drank, and rose up to play. I believe that strongly because there were some present that didn't partake of that sin. I believe that some of them could have overcome the temptation to commit fornication. Why? Because three and 20,000 died that day and not the whole of the camp of Israel. Some of them overcame and did not fall to the temptation to commit fornication. Tempting Christ, murmuring against Him. There were those that never murmured against God, never tempted Him after the fashion of Numbers 21 and Numbers chapter 14. Why? Because they took advantage of the way to escape and they did not yield themselves to the temptation that was put before them. Now, in my experience, as you grow as a Christian, you will quite often be tempted above that you personally, in your flesh, are able to bear it. I've been there. I've been to, as it were, pro proverbially, the end of my rope. I'm finished. I'm done with. I can't take one step more. There's no breath in me. I'm giving up. Ah, and there's the key. The moment that I finally gave up the way of escape came to me because i realized that i in my own flesh could not overcome the temptation to quit could not overcome the temptation to sin could not come the overcome the the temptation to follow after and commit these lusts of the flesh these lusts of the eyes and these pride of life i couldn't do it i give up and then god steps in and takes over and I go in that way of escape, which is trusting him every time. And as a result, I was able to bear it. And I've also been in the other case where I get to the point where I think I can't do it. And you know what I do? I try something else. I try something else. I struggle. I try. I make more efforts. I do something else. And as a result, I never receive that blessing. And too often in, in that pattern and cycle of me trying to overcome my own temptations in my own flesh, eventually I get wore down and eventually I give up. And I fall to the temptation, as these examples for us did. And as most of the world does. Most of the world doesn't even struggle against temptation. They simply receive it and do whatever they're tempted to do. The tenet of Satanism is, do as thou wilt will be the whole of the law. Well, what I will, what I desire, is always wrong. It's always sinful. It's always driven by lust to satisfy myself. And the lust after evil things is what my tendency in my flesh is to do. But myself, when I'm brought to a temptation, I'm not as the world. I have a faithful God who's given me a way of escape so that I can bear the temptation. I can get through it. Even as Jesus long suffered the temptations of the devil 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And afterward, he was an unhungered. But God was there with angels ministering to him to carry him through those last steps, wasn't he? You're able to escape if your escape is to Jesus every time. You're able to stand if you take heed to the words and the examples that are given in scriptures. But if you don't, ye shall fall. Take heed lest ye fall. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6 says, Trust ye in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths and we need to be led and directed by god as we walk with him not trusting in myself not trusting in my strength not trusting in my wisdom not trusting in my ability to overcome the lusts of the eyes the lusts of the flesh the pride of life not trusting in my ability to overcome the temptations of the devil but rather trusting in jesus and trusting in the word of god as my way of escape there are three areas specifically that I think God has taken men in the past and takes us beyond our ability and beyond what we can handle of our own selves. One is our calling. 
The second is our commission. And the third is catastrophe. Some examples, if you would, you can turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. The first example of when God brings us more than we can handle is in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Found my place in Mark somehow. Luke chapter 23. Look with me in verse 27. The first, beyond what we can handle, is our calling, our salvation. We get to a point, don't we, where we just simply can't do what's expected. Verse 27 of Luke 23, it says, And there followed him a great company of people, of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. They shall begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. It doesn't look like the temptation that was given even to the world at that time was so much so that they just wanted it to end. Fall on us, Jesus is saying. You're eventually going to be saying, let it stop. It's over with. It's done with. I can't go anymore. These mountains and hills just might as well fall on us. It's over. Verse 31, it says, For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? If you do these things when, when there's flourishing, when there's green, when there's growth, what shall they do when there's nothing, when there's waste, when it's death, desolate, when the earth is, is dry and languishing? Verse 32, it says, And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. When they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. In another passage, it says that once these malefactors were put up beside Jesus in fulfillment of, I believe, Isaiah 53, him being numbered with the transgressors. Once they were there, they both began to mock. They both began to rail on him. They both began to curse him, even as those that were gathered about. And in that moment, verse 34, it says, And Jesus... And said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots, another fulfillment of scriptures. Jesus cries out to the Father and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In verse 35, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also is written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Now look at verse 39. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and others. And so this one malefactor continues on and in, in, in his railing of Jesus, in his, in his mocking, in his derision, deriding him and, and, and coming at him, mocking him and, and, and proclaiming, save yourself if you're the king of the Jews. And, and he's just saying after the same fashion of those that are around him. Verse 40, it says, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? See, this one had had a change that had taken place. He had gotten to the end of his rope, and unfortunately for a lot of people, to get them to the point where they realize that they can't, let's say, do it themselves. They can't overcome. They, they, they won't give up and humble themselves and, and repent of their unbelief. It, it's at the very end of their life. And here this thief, in his calling, was given more than he could handle. He's got no choice now. What can this man do in order to absolve himself of his guilt? The Bible says here in verse 41, and we indeed justly, he's saying, receive that condemnation. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. He recognized that Christ has done nothing 
wrong in this moment. Christ is perfect, but here I am hanging in the same condemnation that he's experiencing. At this time, receiving due reward justly for the deeds that I have committed. Now, could this guy unnail himself, get down from the cross, and make amends for those guilty deeds that he had done? Could he go and apologize? Could he go make things right? Pay back the debt which he, he owed? Could he apologize to everyone? The only thing that this man could do was die. He was brought to a point where he could do nothing. I think the temptation was around him, and you can see the whole setting played out, to just join in the mocking. He had already participated in the mocking. Just like his counterpart there hanging next to Jesus. Just like these, these people standing, beholding round about. Just like the soldiers. Just like the Jews mocking and railing. The temptation was there for him to just join in to that same thing. And nevertheless, somehow he overcame that temptation. Looked to Jesus and said these words. Verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord... Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. In this moment, he recognized that Jesus was the only one just. Jesus was the only one perfect. Jesus was off to go into his own kingdom. And he said, I want to be there, Lord. I can't get there myself. Look at me, I'm stuck. I'm nailed here. So he turns to Jesus. He avoided the temptation by finding the way to escape, which was the way, the truth, the life of which no man cometh unto the Father apart from him. And Jesus acknowledges it and says, Verily I say unto thee, verse 43, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he returns a response to him that says, Absolutely, I will save you. Absolutely, I will take you to my kingdom. Absolutely, this is not the end of you here, tempted as ye are to fall on this cross. Rather than fall, this one found a way of escape. It was Jesus. We need to get to the point where we acknowledge that we have no escape but Jesus and trust him, even as this thief on the cross did. Again, there was nothing he could do. There was no work of righteousness which he could do. He could not go and offer uh, um, sacrifices there in the temple to make atonement for his sins. There's nothing he could do but simply die. And if he was to simply die, he would have given in the temptation that, that takes over this whole world. And the temptation there is to deny Christ and go on to a devil's hell. The second temptation that God re removes us from, gives us opportunity to escape along with the temptation, is that of catastrophe. If you go to Matthew chapter 14, I'll give you one example. There's plenty of this where in catastrophe... God brings us to a point where we can't save ourselves. We can't overcome a temptation. We can't, we can't do anything apart from fall unless we take the opportunity to trust Him and to believe in Him. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. This is a famous passage. We've been here before. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him and unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. When the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And so here are the disciples. Jesus takes uh, a relief, takes some time to go apart to pray. And now they're in the ship and it's being tossed with waves. This wind being contrary to them, fighting against them as they struggle towards it. It says in verse 25, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking in the sea, on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking in the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried for fear. So here's now their temptation, verse 26, to, to be troubled by the tossing of the waves and to be afraid of the coming of their Lord. It says in verse 27, but straightway Jesus spake, here's the word coming to them, spake unto them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, 
bid me come unto thee on the water. And so he had heard the word, and now Peter is going to apply the word. Peter here is taking opportunity that's given him rather than fall to the temptation of fear. And fear is a sin in our lives because we're to walk faithfully. Rather than give into the temptation of being troubled and, and worried and having care of much things, which is a sin because we're to cast all our cares upon him for he careth for you. Rather, he hears the word and says, you know what, Lord, if that's you, if that's your word, if that's your command, bid me come. And Jesus bids him come and Verse 29. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And so Peter takes opportunity to avoid the temptation and fall in the catastrophe by hearing the word, believing the word enough to get out of the ship and walk to Jesus. Verse 30 though. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. There's fear creeping back into his life and began to sink. So Peter now is, is, is feeling the water come out from underneath him, essentially. What was once hard, solid, able, he was able to walk and traverse it. Now it's, it's, it's soft. It's absorbing him. He's falling into it. He's sinking. Take heed lest ye fall. He should have taken heed to that command and promise, come to me. But he's rather given heed to the temptation to be afraid. He's falling. But in that moment, he finds the way of escape, and it's the Lord. As he cries to him, saying, Lord, save me. Peter acknowledged here he got to the point where he could go no further. He wasn't going to walk on the water anymore. He was going to sink. He was going to be destroyed by the tempestuous wind. He was going to be consumed by the water beneath him. He was going to die, and he could do nothing to save himself. And so he cries out, Lord, save me. Peter walked in the faith that he had for that moment, but that faith was but for a moment because the temptation to doubt, to fall into fear, and to look at his surroundings rather than looking on his Savior came to him. And as a result, he fell to that temptation. But wisely, he called on the Lord, Lord, save me. And he found that way to escape. Here, I believe Peter learned a few things. He learned that we can trust the word. If God bids you come, then just go. As he commanded, he'll carry you through whatever trials are in the path, whatever temptations and trouble are in your way. Peter also learned that he needed not doubt. He needed to be firm in his faith towards God, keeping his eyes on him. He can trust him without fear and without doubt. He knew now that he could trust in the word of God, not only... In the scriptures, of course, but the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's one example of a catastrophe where somebody gets to the point, they're at the end of the rope, and they just can't overcome and need God to pull them through. They need God to provide that way of escape for them. Another one that's just plain that just comes to mind is Exodus. What could the Israelites do when they had the great sea behind them and the greatest army in the world in front of them? They could do nothing but give up their own will and commit themselves into the hands of God who provided for them a way to escape. He parted the Red Sea. They didn't make ships and sail across. He drowned the army. They didn't make weapons and fight. They got to the point where they could not care for themselves. They could not overcome, yes, even this temptation to... Give up. Give in. They had to trust God. You can turn to Jeremiah now if you would. Another example. In the book of Jeremiah the prophet. <clears throat> we have God bring us to something we can't handle as, in regards to salvation. I can't handle my sin. I can't be a sacrifice for my own sin. I can't absolve my own sin. The temptation's there to try. People do it every day. Oh, if I'm a good enough person. Oh, if I commit more good deeds than bad deeds. Oh, if I confess all my sins. If I'm really sorry, I can do it. No. No, you're being tempted by what the world is tempted with you and you're going to fall in that temptation. The way of escape is Jesus and what he offered for your sins. Catastrophe. You get to the point where, you know what? I just can't go any further. I'm, I'm, I'm suffering in this. I'm, I'm sad and lonely in this. I'm struggling. I just want to give up. 
And at that moment, God is there with a way of escape. And he will encourage you the same way he did Peter. You can trust the word. You need not doubt. You can trust in Jesus. He is the way of escape for you. When you're in catastrophe. Also in our commission. God gives us to-dos. He has plans for you. He has plans for your life. That he wants you to fulfill. He has a perfect will for you. He has desires for you. Even as he came to Moses and told Moses, here is my commission for you. You shall lead this people. Moses' response was, but I'm slow of speech. They won't hear me. And so God eventually gives him Aaron, but at the same time, God says, who made your mouth? Don't fall to that temptation to think that you can't do what God wants you to do as far as his commission and his plans for you. Isaiah was called and given a commission. When he heard the voice of God, he, he, he cried out, I am done, undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in, in a, amongst a people of unclean lips. I can't do this. And he was falling to the temptation of, of, of pride. He was falling to the temptation of 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 self-loathing even. I am undone. I am of unclean lips. And God said, I'll touch your lips and I'll do with you as I please. Ezekiel fell as dead, we know that, before God lifted him up and put him on his feet. Now we have Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God calls prophets even in the womb. God appoints men to handle his word and to proclaim his word, and to preach his word even in the womb. He has a special ordination for everybody. You may not be called to be a prophet. You may not be called to be a preacher. But you may be called to be a, a help. You may be called to care for somebody. You may be called to be a blessing in some other way, but God has a calling for you. And that happened before you were formed in the belly. God knew you and what he wanted from you and for you. Now the temptation when hearing something like that is to say, oh no, not me. No, that's 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 beyond what, what I can do. I'm not capable of that. that that's That's something for men of of great honor. That's something for men that are stronger than I. That's too big of a responsibility. I can't live up to God's expectations for me. And that's exactly how Jeremiah received this calling. Verse 6, it says, Then said I, Oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. I can't come under the, the weight of such responsibility. I can't perform a job do which which such honor is due i can't be a prophet to these nations maybe he's saying you know go go talk to somebody else like moses did he says i can't do it and here he falls to the temptation to 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 just not come to what god has for him to bear verse 7 but the lord said unto me say not i am a child For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and behold, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Jeremiah says, I can't do this. I can't even speak. God says, Yeah, you can speak. Here. My words are in your mouth. And I will deliver thee, and I will be with thee. Don't be afraid of their faces. You will indeed go and be that prophet to the nations. So we see again another example of of in the commission given to a believer. He was given something more than he could handle. He admits, I can't handle this. And in that moment, God says, yes, but I will be with thee. I will deliver thee. I will touch your mouth, and there my words will rest. And there they will go forth from. Jeremiah chapter 20, we catch him a little bit further in his ministry at this time. 
It says in Jeremiah chapter 20 with the context in verse 1, Now Pasher, Jeremiah 20 verse 1, Now Pasher, the son of Immer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet, put him in stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I've never been in stocks. I've never been in prison, but I think that's a point where you start to feel pretty helpless. You start to feel pretty useless as far as changing your destiny. Hopeless. There's nothing I can do at this point. And Jeremiah was no different. There is no temptation taking you, but such is common to men. And here, Jeremiah shows his, his manly side, his fleshly side. In verse 7, he says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Is he referring back to the moment when, when he said that I would be with you? To Jeremiah, was he, was he referring back to the moment when he said, we said, I will be with your mouth, you shall be a prophet to all nations. And he's now in prison. He's like, God, you've deceived me. I was deceived. Maybe. Continues on in verse 7. Thou art stronger than I. Well, there's a good statement we should all be willing to admit. Thou art stronger than I. and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me in a derision daily. He cried violence and spoil was because the word of the Lord was violence and spoil. And that was put in his mouth and he went and he proclaimed that. And now he's smitten. Now he's in stocks. Now he's in the high gates, locked up, and barred from freedom. Verse 9 he says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more of his name. The prophet gave up. Here's the temptation that he's been faced with to give up. Leave off his commission. Leave off his calling. Stop speaking in the name of the Lord. He's cried violence. He's cried spoil. As the word of the Lord came to him, he feels deceived. But he makes that statement, God, you are stronger than I. And he acknowledges that and so verse 9 continues, but his word, his word, there's your escape. His word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. When the temptation came to quit, God's word was a fire in the heart of Jeremiah. When the temptation was to stop proclaiming the word of God, the word of God was a fire in the heart and in the bones of Jeremiah. And he could not give up what he had been tempted to give up just a few minutes before. He says, I'm going to quit. And the word says, no, you're not. God takes over and God provides the way of escaping the temptation that was placed before Jeremiah. Jeremiah was given something that he could not handle. He could not handle prison. He could not handle the derision coming upon him by the word of God and by them that hated him and by them that were mocking him. He says, I'm derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. I'm bringing this message of violence and spoil because that's what the word of God says and I can't do it anymore. I will not speak anymore in his name. And as soon as he says that, the word of God is there empowering him to not forbear, not give up, but to stay. He could not stay, but he needed to stand at that time. He could not stay, the Bible says. I believe he was given a way of escape there. And Jeremiah was in a sorry state. <laughs> We're in a sorry state here. There's times I feel like quitting. There's times I feel I can't overcome the temptation to just pack it in. and Just give up on the Christian life. Stop fighting. Stop preaching. Stop leading, stop doing what I believe God has called me to do simply because of the sorry state of my surroundings. If I'm falling into that temptation, it's because I have not been focusing on the God who is faithful and gave me a way of escape. If I fall to the temptation, I am no better than the rest of the world. It's like I'm basically just disallowing God, rejecting Him, to just fall with the world to every temptation, every wind of struggle and trial that comes into my life. 
verse 10, it says, For I heard the defaming of many. For I heard the defaming of many. Fear on every side. Report, say they. We will report it. All my familiars watch for my halting. You know what he's saying there? All my family. All those that were close to me watch for me to give up. Jeremiah heard the defaming. All of his friends were, were, were against him. He was in derision. He was being mocked. He said, all my family, watch for me to give up. Peradventure he will be enticed. And we shall prevail against him. And we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. He was tempted. He was feeling like giving up. The word entered his heart as that burning fire shut up in his bones. He could not forbear. He could not stay. He remembered what God had said back to him. Chapter 1. I will be with thee. And he says, the Lord is with me as a mighty terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble. And they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. And what is, who is Jeremiah to do any of those things in his own life? Here locked up in stocks, in prison. Is he going to deal with the persecutors? Is he going to overcome them and shame them? Is he going to make it so they don't prosper and they're confused in their own position? No. It's God that is with him that is going to overcome for him. Verse 12, But O Lord of hosts that tries the righteous and seeth the reins and hearts, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of the evildoer. So even in a sorry state, as sorrowful as it is that Jeremiah is in, he was able to sing, and I believe we can sing too. But God wants to be strong on your behalf. In order for God to be strong on your behalf, I believe too often we need to get brought to the place where we understand we're not strong enough on our own behalf. We need to be brought to the place where we're at the end of our rope, where it's too much. When all hope is lost, I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to be done with it. I quit. It's at that time that God's ready, willing, rather, to be strong on your behalf. We just have to lean on him. We just have to trust him. We just have to, in all our ways, acknowledge him so that he can direct our paths. Verse, chapter 32 of Jeremiah. Chapter 32 of Jeremiah. Let me just read one statement there in Jeremiah 32 and verse 26. Then came the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 32, verse 26. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Good question. The answer, of course, is no, God. There's nothing too hard for you. Now, if I was to turn that around and make that statement for myself, I am Josh. I'm butt flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's plenty too hard for me. There's plenty of things that I can't handle. I can't overcome. And I'm thankful that when I get to that point where I cannot handle something that is too hard for me, I am thankful that I have with that temptation God waiting as my way of escape. And I can trust in Jesus, lean on him and not lean on myself. The Bible says in this same book of Jeremiah, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh the flesh his arm. The Lord is the God of all flesh. I am but flesh. Why would I trust in flesh? When I can trust God that has nothing, nothing, nothing that is too hard for him. My help is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. My trust is in the Lord. In Lamentations, at the end of Jeremiah, Lamentations chapter 3, Jeremiah's, uh, this this psalm, this this, this poem, perhaps, this lamentation of, of what he's going through, what he's been through, comes out in this, Wonderful saying, as he sees all of Jerusalem in Lamentations 3, as he sees it destroyed, as he sees it 
without hope. As he sees it completely famished as a widow weeping sore in the night, mourning adversaries chief over her. She's grievously sinned and so therefore the adversaries come upon her. She's been filthy. Jeremiah is weeping over her. He's lamenting her. He's heard the sigh of her as the enemies move in and cause trouble to come upon her. God is fierce in his anger towards her. He's stern in his judgment towards her. She has it coming. She deserves it. All her enemies are coming to destroy her. They are destroying her at this very time. And Jeremiah can just look and preach and mourn and cry and weep over her. And there in Lamentations 3, though, there's this phrase. Lamentations 3, verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. So he's seeing all of the calamity, all of the destruction, all of the catastrophe, all of the endless suffering and mourning. There is no hope, but Jeremiah recalls this to his mind. And when he does, it gives him hope. Verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Our faithful God has provided mercies. Our faithful God has given us compassion. Our faithful God will not suffer that ye be tempted. Above that ye are able, but will with every temptation also give you a way of escape. And if you should choose to accept the way of escape, you will receive of his mercies. You will not be consumed. You will overcome the temptations that are coming upon your life. You will be able to overcome things that are beyond what you can handle in your own flesh. You will be an overcomer, but you're only an overcomer if you overcome in the power of his might. You put your hope in God. You put your help in God and you quit trusting in the arm of flesh. His mercies are the reason you're not consumed by your challenges, your struggles, and your temptations. His mercies are the reason you are not failing and falling as the world does without the faithful God. His mercies are there for you every morning. Go get them again, anew and afresh. Take him as that portion for your soul. Hope in him. He really is the only hope, and I've been there. Some of my closest times with God were at the times when I just gave up. It was a heap on the ground. I had no hope. And it's in those moments I realized God is merciful. God is compassionate. God is good. Verse 25, it says, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so be there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled with, full with reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Look at God here says, look, it's good for you. He's giving us grief but he has compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. He's not willingly afflicting, verse 33, the children of men. He's not intentionally and directly trying to grieve them. But he's doing it to a positive end. Verse 27, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. It is good for you that you take the way offered you when you're in trials, when you're in temptations, and you bear it with God. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. It makes you have a different perspective on things. You're sitting alone sometimes when you're bearing a temptation. 
You may be putting your mouth in the dust, asking for hope. I promise you, though, on the other side, once you finally reach the end of your rope, once you feel like you've cried your last tear, once all hope is lost, I'm going to give up. It's enough, Lord. Let the mountains and hills fall on me. That's the moment God's waiting there to give you compassion, to give you love, to help you to bear what you are going through. Sometimes we give in to our temptations. Sometimes we turn back in the day of battle. In other words, uh -uh, I don't want to deal with that temptation. I'm just going to avoid it and go somewhere else. But those temptations are there to help you. Those temptations are there to bring you to a place where you're trusting fully in God and none else. You all did that when you were saved. You did that to receive salvation. You gave up trying to work for your salvation and you trusted wholly in the God that will freely give you compassion and mercy. Do that in your Christian life. When you're brought to a point where you simply cannot overcome what's being put in front of you, Give that trial, give that care, give that temptation to God who is able to help you bear it. He is the way of escape. He is the word of God. He is who empowers you to overcome what you're being tried with. God gives you more than you can handle, but you can handle it. You can bear it if you're doing so in the spirit of God. Taking his way of escape is guided by the word is guided by the Spirit as led of Christ. That's the Christian walk. And you'll be stronger having overcome and walked through this with Him. Thank you, God.